So uh, I'm the chancellor of this campus. In fact, I'm privileged to be the chancellor of this campus. And um, I just wanted to give you a, a brief description of who we are. We are a campus of 34,000 students, 97% between 18 and 33 years of age. So you're all the millennials. Most racially diverse and best educated in the US in modern history. 20% of you have at least one parent who's an immigrant. And you are the most technologically savvy, which we all know, since we come to you to let us know how to use all of these <laughs> technologies. But at the same time, you have some of the biggest problems among all of the most recent, historically speaking, generations in the US. So the highest levels of student loans, the highest unemployment, the lower levels of wealth and personal income compared to any other generation, at least the ones, the two before you. A lot of times as the chancellor, they ask me to um, talk about these issues, but I always find myself inadequate in trying to address these problems, just talking from my own point of view a person who was born 60 years ago, at least 30 or 40 years older than you are. And I thought that the best way to talk about the problems is to bring my daughter, who is a member of the millennials, your generation, and someone who can really challenge me without shame. <laughs> <laughs> so I will turn it to her. Okay, um, thanks mom. So my name is Helena Saragunas. Um, and I was born in 1987, so that puts me smack in the middle of the millennial generation. Um, and I went straight from undergrad to law school, and I've only been in the workforce for like a year and a half, so you know, I feel the anxiety of thinking about what you're gonna do after you go to school. Um, that's still very fresh in my mind. And I think it's interesting to think about how our experiences and what we're gonna have to deal with once we graduate and enter the career force is gonna be different from what you know, our parents went through and the boomer generation went through. And I think that's a good way to segue into a discussion about the differences between the two generations. Right, so there are conflicts and there are similarities. And we'll talk about those. Now, I'm not, I'm not, we are not gonna to talk too much about this data. These are there available. Of course, it shows some specific different ways that we all live our lives and have expectations about ourselves and our careers. But we'll start about the boomers versus the millennials. Um, people say that we, the boomers, are focused, disciplined, prefer structured environments. We look for long, strong leadership and um, strong strategic directions. We seek individual recognition and we work hard to promote ourselves. And of course, we wanna succeed economically. We wanna have a lot of wealth. How about the millennials? Yeah, so we're workaholics too, but just in a different way, right? We're not gonna sit there and adhere to traditional rigid work environments. We want flexible hours, we want benefits. Um, and more than that, we wanna be at the table when decisions are made. We wanna be involved and we're willing to work in teams and collaborate to reach decisions that we think are good for the company or whatever career field we might be in. Now, but people say that you are the me generation. <laughs> that was in 2013. Okay, but let's see the next one, right? <laughs> All right, so you were 22 years old when this came out and we weren't even born yet and um, I think, you know, this is important to look at these two different slides because it shows you that this idea that the younger generation is entitled, narcissistic, lazy, this isn't unique to us, right? It's something that has pervaded across generations. So we have something in common. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you that. Well, before we speak more about our differences or similarities, important for us to find out what defined us and what, what inspired us. So for us, for the boomers, three wars. The second war through our parents, we had all the stories at home when we were growing up. The Cold War, we lived it with fear. And the Vietnam War, we lived it with fear and dismay. Now in terms of 
What inspired us, of course, space, um, a lot, but then the um, um, civil rights movement, a lot, and then, of course, Pink Floyd, for me. <laughs> <laughs> How about you? Okay, so what is our generation defined by? And, you know, I don't want to overstate this, but aren't we really shaped by the recession? And I think it's interesting to think about this because this is where the link between the millennial generation and the boomer generation gets kind of a tenuous, right? Because I graduated in 2009, right? And if I hadn't gone straight to grad school, I don't know what my employment options would have been like. I was a lit major. And um, there were, uh, of my friends who were looking for careers, there just wasn't a lot out there compared to what had been five to six years ago. Um, so there was a lot of, anger and hostility towards the boomer generation, kind of like these policies that led to the recession, we weren't even old enough to have a say in, and now we're kind of bearing the brunt of it. So even if we weren't part of a cause of the recession, right, we were part of the effect, and what do I mean by that? I mean that we played a role in the aftermath, from national movements like Occupy Wall Street to global political movements like protests in places like Greece or Spain, um, that were linked to high unemployment and the, the global financial crisis. I mean, that, that came from our generation. So we have really taken an active role in this issue. And, you know, enough doom and gloom, because I, I think maybe the recession does shape us and define us, but it's not what inspires us, right? And back to uh, what my mom said about um, the civil rights movement during the boomer generation, you see the after effects with us. So we're the most diverse generation. And we, our generation, voted into the presidency, the first African-American president, and we did that twice, right? Um, and we're also the age of technology. So our children are not gonna know what it was like to get an AOL CD in the mail that said 50 free hours, right? <laughs> or to have like a flip phone that doesn't take a picture. So, you know, this is, technology is changing along with us, and we're really the pioneers of that movement, I think. Um, and then finally, the age of entrepreneurs. So you have a website like Kickstarter, which is uh, celebrating its fifth year anniversary this year. And that does, to me, that's not a lazy and entitled generation, right? This is a creative and innovative generation. So the question is, what's next? And maybe we need to go to this one, that our two generations have one thing in common, and this is our future. And what that really means is this is your future. So how can we help? Yeah, so this is, so <laughs> I don't know, this is a really hard question. And when my mom first asked it to me, I was just like, I don't know, I, I'm not sure. Um, but I thought about it and- Other than financially. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, other than that. But, you know, I thought about it and I think that where we are, a lot of us in our lives, we don't really know what we want from the future. We are excited about the possibilities, but we don't know what the future is gonna be and where our decisions are gonna take us. So what can we use? We can use a platform. We can use the resources to put us in the best position to make those decisions in the long run. So thinking about that, I think there's three points I wanted to touch upon. And the first, um, I know a lot of you know, and potentially some of you are going to be exiting either undergraduate or graduate school with tens of thousands and maybe even hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt, right? And that's just the, the reality of um, the economics today. And so we really need to work towards having some better policies that are gonna help students really be able to start on a career path, not being saddled down with these huge amounts of debt. Um, and I think you know, that's kind of a reactive uh, result, right? So if we wanna be proactive, we have to look at the front end and think about affordable education. And what does this mean? Does it mean better financial aid or scholarships on the front end so that we all have the opportunities and people in our generation who maybe don't have access to some of the resources that others might have will have the opportunity to go to college and uh, graduate school as well and really come out um, on a good career path. And finally, and this is something that I've really seen in, as I've entered the workforce, is college can prepare you and graduate school can prepare you for a lot of things, but sometimes there just isn't practical skill development. 
And the, the truth of the matter is now, with the post-recession economy, what people in different industries want is students who are able to hit the ground running and enter the career force and be able to work and apply practical skills. So I think schools really need to put an emphasis on making programs available and uh, classes available and different training so that when you exit school, you're actually prepared to enter a career. And so I think those three points are really, you know, well, important. They, there is a lot of work to be done, but I think we need to work to get together. Mm -hmm. And, um, and we need to work together in, in many ways, but we need to be partners in this solution. And um, as I say, I hope that all of you will participate in, you've heard the previous speaker talking about democratizing education. That means that we bring the issues forward and then we have an expectation that we will all work together to be able to find the, the right solution for you. Because without your success and your great future, we will not have any. There is no future for anybody unless you become successful. So with that, we want to thank you for giving us the opportunity to have this discussion in front of you. Thanks.